and the last test walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad it is so stringent it's impossible for anyone besides allah subhanahu wa taala the true almighty god to pass it says there's nothing like him the moment you can imagine the moment you can draw a mental picture what god is he is not god we know that rajnish it was a human being like you and me he had one head two hands two legs two eyes one nose one mouth long flowing beard long hair so surely he can't be almighty god walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad there is nothing like him and this test walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad is so stringent that no one besides allah subhanahu wa taala can pass suppose someone says that anil swashnigar you know anil swashnigar the person who's known as the strongest man in the world he was given the title mr universe is suppose someone says that almighty god he's a thousand times as strong as anil swashnigar the moment you can compare god to anyone whether it be anil swashnigar whether it be dara singh or king kong whether it be a thousand times or a million times the moment you can compare almighty god to anyone he is not almighty god walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad there is nothing like him this is a four line definition given in the holy quran surah ikhlas which is the touchstone of theology we muslims we prefer calling allah subhanahu wa taala by the arabic name allah instead of the english word god because the arabic word allah it is pure it is unique whereas the english word god it can be played around with you can play around with that word if you add a s to god it becomes gods plural of god there is nothing like plural allah in islam qul huwa allahu ahad say he is allah one and only if you add a d e s s to god it becomes goddess a female god there is nothing like male allah or female allah in islam allah is unique he has got no gender if you add a father to god it becomes godfather he is my godfather he is my guardian there is nothing like allah father in islam or allah abba in islam if you add a mother to god it becomes godmother there's nothing like allah mother or allah ammi in islam allah is a unique word it's a pure word if you prefix a tin before god it becomes tin god there's nothing like tin allah in islam that's the reason we muslims we prefer calling allah subhanahu wa taala by the arabic word allah instead of the english word god but if some muslims if they use this word by speaking to non muslims i have got no objection because non muslim may not know what is the concept of allah so if anyone uses god for allah i have got no objection but the more appropriate word is allah otherwise the holy quran says in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 110 qul idullah aw idur rahman ayyak ma tad'u falal asma wal husna say call upon him by allah or by rahman by whichever name you call upon him it is well to him belongs the most beautiful name you can call allah subhanahu wa taala by any name but it should be a beautiful name it should not conjure up a mental picture and there are no less than 99 different attributes given of allah subhanahu wa taala in the holy quran no less than 99 different attributes of allah subhanahu wa taala are given in the holy quran for example ar rahman ar rahim al karim most gracious most merciful most benevolent is called as rab ar razik as lord cherisher sustainer provider no less than 99 different attributes are given in the holy quran for allah subhanahu wa taala and the same message is repeated besides Surah Isra chapter 70 verse number 110 it is also mentioned in Surah Taha chapter number 20 verse number 
in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 180, as well as in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 24, which says, To Allah belongs the most beautiful names. But whatever attribute you give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God, it should be a unique attribute. It should only refer to Him and to no one else. And if we reverse the order, it should yet point out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, I am 5 feet 11 inches tall. I wear spectacles. I live in Bombay. If someone says that Dr. Zakir Naik is 5 feet 11 inches tall, it's a correct characteristic. But if we reverse it, who is 5 feet 11 inches tall? You will find more than a thousand people who are 5 feet 11 inches tall. It doesn't point specifically to me. It's not unique. If you say, Dr. Zakir Naik wears spectacles, it's correct. But it's not unique. Because if you reverse it, who wears spectacles? There will be more than a thousand people who wear spectacles. If someone says, Dr. Zakir Naik lives in Bombay, he's right. But it's not unique. Who lives in Bombay? More than a million people live in Bombay. So the attribute that you give should be unique. For example, if someone says that Dr. Zakir Naik is the father of Farik Zakir Naik, who was born on the 10th of July 1994 in Jangir Nursing Home in Pune, that's a unique attribute. Because if we reverse it, who is the father of Farik Zakir Naik? born on the 10th of July 1994 in Jangir Nursing Home in Pune, the answer is only one, Dr. Zakir Naik, no one else. It's a unique attribute. It points out to no one but one person. Similarly, let me give you another example. That Dr. Zakir Naik is the founder chairman of IRF Educational Trust, which was established on the 6th of November 1992 in Dongri, Mumbai. If we reverse it, who is the founder chairman of IRF Educational Trust, which was established on the 6th of November 1992 in Dongri, Mumbai? The answer is only one, Dr. Zakir Naik. Similarly, if you call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any attribute, by any name, it should be unique. You can't say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of a building. Because even many builders can build buildings. You can call him the creator of the universe. Khalik, the creator. Who is the creator? Only one. Who is the ultimate creator of the universe? Only one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Rahman. Who is the most gracious? The answer is only one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Rahim. Who is the most merciful? The answer is only one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it should be a unique attribute. The example I gave of myself was unique, but nothing great. Being the founder chairman, of IRF Education Trust is nothing great. It's unique, fine. It's nothing great. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, besides the attribute being unique, it is something ultimate. Being the father of Parik Zakir Naik is not ultimate. It's unique. It's not ultimate. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attribute, besides being unique, should be ultimate. You cannot give attributes which are just common, which you and I can also do. Secondly, Besides giving unique attributes, it should not be combined with characteristics which do not belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if someone says that Dr. Zakir Naik is the father of Farik Zakir Naik, who was born on the 10th of July 1994, Zangin Nursing Home in Pune, and is four feet tall. The attribute is correct. I am the father of the person who he said, but I am not four feet tall. I am 5 feet 11 inches tall. So if someone says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God is a creator, but he has got a human form like you and me, one head, two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two hands, the creator attribute is correct, but the characteristic of a human form is wrong. So besides the attribute being unique, it should not be mixed up with false attributes. And the third is that the attribute 
the various attributes that you give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should point only to one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not more than that. Because there's only one. Kul hu Allah hu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. So if someone says, the Dr. Zakir Naik is the father of Parik Zakir Naik, born on the 10th of July 1994, in Jangir Nasingam Pune, and Abdullah Sheikh is the founder chairman of IRF Irrigation Trust, which was established on 6th of November 1992 in Dongri, Mumbai. One attribute is correct of mine, but my attribute is given to another person who is not me. Abdullah Sheikh and Dr. Zakir Naik aren't the same. So you cannot say that Khalik, the creator, is one God and Ar Rahim, the merciful, is another God. If someone says that rain God is different, cloud God is different, and sun God is different, and creator is different, and cherisher is different, it's totally wrong. The attributes are correct, but it should point out only to one person and no one else. People may ask me that what is wrong in having more than one God? The polytheists they may say, Dr. Zakir Naik, what is the harm in having many gods? If we have many gods, there will be fighting between them. And each one will try to defeat the other and try and establish his rule. So people may say, see we can divide. One is a god of rain, one is a god of sun, one is a god who created, one is a god who is a cherisher. If we divide such way and have multiple gods, that means one god is unable to do the things of the other god. He does not have knowledge of the other god. It means it's a deficient god. It's not an ultimate God and we don't want to believe in a deficient God. We want to believe in a God which is ultimate, the Supreme. No wonder you find in the mythology of certain religions, God fighting among themselves. And one God killing the other God and one God takes help of the other God to defeat the third God. This is found in the mythology. The Holy Quran gives the answer in Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 22. That it says that if there were more gods besides Allah, there would surely be confusion. And we know that there is no confusion in the universe. The universe is running harmoniously. It further mentioned in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 91, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have any sons, neither does He have any partners. If there were many gods besides Allah, each god would have taken what they created and would have hoarded over the other. So surely, there has to be only one true God. If you analyze all the religions which speak about concept of God, all of them ultimately believe in monotheism. That is, they believe in one God. Any religion which believes in a concept of God, ultimately that religion believes only in one God at a higher level. At the lower level there may be other gods, but at the higher level it finally believes in one God only. If you analyze the scriptures of Almighty God, they spoke about the true concept of Almighty God. But later on the scriptures, they got manipulated. They got interpolated. They got corrupted. Why? By people for their own requirements, to fulfill their own material desires. And later on, you have a religion which has been changed from monotheism to polytheism or pantheism. The Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, Verse number 79. Woe to those who write the book with their own hands. Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say, This is from Allah. To traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to those for what their hands do write and woe to those for what they earn. So the Holy Quran says that people have changed the scripture of Almighty God for their own material desires, 
woe to such people and woe to what they earn. There are certain religions like Buddhism, Confucianism, you have Taoism, which do not comment on God. Neither do they confirm nor deny the existence of Almighty God. It's called as an agnostic religion. We have other religions like Jainism which are atheistic. They deny the existence of Almighty God. Regarding how to prove to the atheist or the agnostic the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you can refer to my video cassette Is the Quran God's Word Part 1 and 2 This talk was given about two years ago in the same auditorium Two years ago in the same auditorium Billah Matushri where I've proved here to an atheist to an agnostic to a Muslim, Christian Buddhist, Jain whether he be a scientist to all these people with reason, logic and science on the basis of the Holy Quran the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so all those who want to know how to prove to an atheist or agnostic the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you can refer to my video cassette I think it's available in the foyer outside it's available for sale outside part 1 and part 2 in Islam we believe in Tawheed Tawheed does not merely mean monotheism or merely meaning believing in one God it has much more to it Tawheed means unification asserting oneness and is derived from the Arabic verb Wahda which means to unite to unify, to consolidate. And there are three categories in Tawheed. The first is Tawheed or Rububiya. is derived from the verb Rub, which means Lord, Cherisher, Sustainer. It means maintaining the unity of Lordship. And the basic concept here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who created all the things which exist. He is not dependent on anything or any person, but all things and persons are dependent on Him. He is absolute, whereas all the other things, they are relative and they are temporarily and they are conditional. The second category is Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat, which means maintaining the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. And there are basically five points in this category. The first is Allah should be referred to according to what Allah and His Messenger described Him. Second is Allah should be referred to as He has referred to Himself. No one can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al ghadib the angry one. So the Quran says that he gets angry, but that's a quality, which you cannot say, the angry one, because Allah and his messenger didn't give that attribute to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third is, you cannot give human qualities to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like some scripture says that God Almighty, after creating the universe, he rested. He was tired. Some scriptures say that he repented. See, repenting, getting tired are acts which human beings require. Not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the criteria for this category is from Surah Ashura, chapter 42, verse number 11, which says, Laisa ka mislihi that there is nothing whatever like him. There is nothing whatever like him. And the verse continues. He is the seer and hearer of all things. But this seeing and hearing cannot be compared with what we human beings see and hear. Because for us to hear, we require sound waves. We require a hear, apparatus. God Almighty does not require all these things. 
so allah subhanahu wa taala sees and hears in a different way as compared to what we human beings see and hear the fourth point is that allah subhanahu wa taala's attribute cannot be given to any of his creatures like you can't call a human being without a beginning and without an end a person who will not die he is eternal you can't give this attribute to any human being or any of the creation of allah subhanahu wa taala and the last point is you cannot give the names of allah subhanahu wa taala to any of his creatures without prefixing abd certain indefinite forms like rauf rahim can be given but the definite form ultimate without prefixing ab you cannot give like abdur rahman abdur rahim abd means slave slave of rahman ar rahman slave of ar rahim abdullah slave of allah neither can you give this ab to anyone besides allah subhanahu wa taala you cannot say abdur rasul the slave of the messenger you cannot say abdun nabi the slave of the prophet the third category of tawhid is tawhid al ibada the ibada has been derived from the arabic word abd which means slave servant ibada means to worship but many people have the misconception that worship merely means offering prayers a prayer is one of the high form of worship but that's not the only form of worship as i said ibada is derived from ab meaning slave servitude so worship means any commandments you follow of allah subhanahu wa taala you are doing worship anything which you do not do what allah has asked you not to do that is ibada so ibada is not merely prayers it has much more to it obeying the commandments of allah subhanahu wa taala is ibada without following the third category of tawhid al ibada which is maintaining the unity of worship following the first two categories only is useless because the holy quran says that there were pagans arabs at the time of the prophet who believe in the first two categories that is tawhid al rububiyah and tawhid al asma wa sifat but not in the third category and they were referred as mushriks and kafirs idolaters and rejectors of faith the holy quran says in surah yunus chapter number 10 verse number 31 say who is he that sustains life to you in the sky and the earth or who is it that hears and sees all things and who is it that gives life to things that are dead and gives death to things which are alive who is it that regulates and controls the affairs soon they will say it is allah so why don't you have piety towards him why don't you worship him a similar message is given in surah zukhruf chapter 43 verse number 87 that when you ask them who has created them they will say allah but they are far deluded from the truth so the pagans arab at the time of the prophet even they had a concept of one supreme almighty god which they called as allah but along with it they even had about 360 idols which they worship so if you worship anyone besides allah subhanahu wa taala then you are not following the third category of tawhid al ibada and with the first second or third category of tawhid is missed by anyone or if there is any deficiency in fulfilling any point of any of the three categories it is called as shirk shirk means associating partners it means sharing and in islamic terms it means associating partners with allah subhanahu wa taala the biggest sin which is mentioned in the holy quran is shirk associating partners with allah subhanahu wa taala it does not only mean that you worship some other god but shirk 
that is not fulfilling any of the three categories of Tawheed leads to shirk. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive associating partners to Him. If He pleases, He may forgive anything else. But the sin of associating partners with Allah, He shall never forgive. The same message is repeated in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116. That those who do the sin of joining gods with Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive them. Anything else if He pleases, He may forgive. But all those who join gods with Allah, they have strayed far away from the truth. It's mentioned for Maida chapter 5 verse number 72. لَقَدْ قَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَصِيُّ إِبْنُ مَرْيَمَ That they are doing kuf. Those who say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. وَقَالَ الْمَصِيُّ But said Christ, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِلْ Ocean of Israel, أَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَشِبَ اللَّهِ رَبِّي وَرَبَّكُمْ Who is my Lord and your Lord. إِنَّهُ مَا يَشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ Anyone who associates partners with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannat haram for them. وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِ مِنْ أَنْسَارِ And fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helper in the hereafter. The Holy Quran says that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, إِنَّهُ مَا يَشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ Anyone who associates partners with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannat haram for him. وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِ مِنْ أَنْسَارِ And fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helper in the hereafter. When I start my talk, in the beginning of it, the Qari, he recited verses of Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, تَعَالَ وِلَا قَلْمِتِنْ سَوَائِمْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ That come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na uda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. It doesn't say we believe in one and only Allah. Believing is not sufficient. It says Allah na uda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bi hi shayyam. That we associate no partners with Him. So only believing in one God is not sufficient. You should even only worship Him and no one else and associate no partners with him. The Holy Quran says in Surah Anam chapter 6, verse number 180, Revile not ye those whom they worship besides Allah, lest out of spite they revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their ignorance. The Holy Quran says in Surah Luqman chapter 31, verse number 27, that if all the trees on the earth were made into pen, and the ocean into ink, and the seven ocean to back it up, yet the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be exhausted in writing. Because he is all powerful, full of wisdom. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the Holy Quran from Surah Al Hajj, chapter 22, verse number 73, which says, E men, there is a parable set forth for you. Listen to it. Those whom you call upon, anyone besides Allah, they cannot even create a fly. They cannot even create a fly if all of them got together. And if the fly took away something from them, they cannot even release from it. Feeble are those who petition, feeble are those on whom they petition. Waakhru dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. To analyze the concept of God in major religions adequately for all present here today, in the limited time available, we would like the following rules to be followed during the question and answer session. Questions asked should be on the topic, concept of God in major religions only. Questions not relevant to the topic, including any general questions on religion, will not be allowed. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. 
for your second question you would have to go at the back of the row again and await your second chance to ask your question three mics have been provided for the questions from the audience in the auditorium two in the front next to the stage on my right and left side and one at the back in the ladies section please stand in the queue at one of the mics if you wish to put a question to the speaker and speak into the mic only when the mic handing assistant hand the mic to you we will allow one question on each of the mics in clockwise rotation written questions on slip papers which are available from our volunteers on the sides and in the center aisle would be given secondary preference after the questions on the mics are answered by dr zakir and if time permits kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question may we have the first question from the lady side please assalam alaikum i am saba bakai from delhi and my question to ms zakir ankur is the christian concept of the god is a trinity the father the son and the holy ghost but these three one, three are one does this mean that they believe in only one god the sister asked the question that the christian believe in trinity the father the son and the holy ghost and that they are one does it mean that they also believe in one god so if you analyze the word trinity it occurs no in the bible if you search the full bible the word trinity doesn't exist anywhere in the bible it's not there in the bible but the word trinity is there in the holy quran but the word trinity is there in the holy quran the holy quran says in surah nisa chapter 4 verse number 171 it says wala taqulu salasa don't say trinity in the khairul lakum this is stop it is better for you for god is one god it's again repeated in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 73 it says laqad kafara alladhina qalu inna allaha salisu salasa they blaspheme those who say that allah is one of three in a trinity for there is no god but allah so the word trinity is not mentioned in the bible but it is there in the quran and quran says wala taqulu salasa don't say trinity the closest verse that you can find in the bible which can be taken for trinity is the first epistle of john chapter number 5 verse number 7 which says for there are three that bear record in heaven the father the word and the holy ghost and these three are one this was of the bible first epistle of john chapter 5 verse number 7 is the closest resemblance to trinity in the full bible but if you read the revised standard version which has been revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 different christian cooperating denominations they have removed this verse from the bible as an interpolation as a concoction as a fabrication it was not removed by muslims or non christian scholars but it was removed by 32 christian scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 different corporate denomination as an interpolation as a concoction as a fabrication because it was not there in the original manuscript we muslims we should thank the galaxies of deities the doctors of divinity for getting the bible one step closer to the quran closer to islam as the quran says wala taqulu salasa don't say trinity In fact if you analyze as I said in my talk Jesus Christ peace be upon him never spoke about trinity 
that Father, Son and Holy Ghost, they were one. In fact, she said, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse number 28, My Father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, My Father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, With the finger of God I cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my will, but the will of thy Father who has sent me. He never spoke about Trinity. In fact, when he was asked that which is the first of the commandments, he said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29, Shama Israelo, Adnai Lahaino Adnai Khad, which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. But if you ask the Christian church, in the catechism, they tell you that the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But they aren't three persons, they are one person. Person, 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 but not three person, one person. What language is this? One plus one plus one is equal to three. It's not equal to one. One into three is three, not one. So when we ask them, that suppose there are three triplets, identical triplets. If one of them commits murder, can you hang the other? They say no. Then you ask them why? Because each one has a different personality. If one of the triplets commit murder, you can't hang the other because each one has a different personality. And when the Christian, when they think about the Father in heaven, they think like an old man like Santa Claus sitting in the heaven on one of the planets with the earth as a footstool. When they think about the Son, that Jesus Christ peace be upon him, they think of a tall man who is fair, who has got blonde eyes, like Jeffrey Hunter, you see in the movie King of Kings. He did the acting of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, Jeffrey Hunter. They have a certain mental picture. When they talk about Holy Ghost, they think of a dove, as the Bible says, which came upon Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he was baptized. Or they think it like a spirit that came at the Feast of Pentecost, which is mentioned in the Bible. But when you ask the Christian that when you speak about Trinity, how many pictures do you have in your mind, the Christian will tell you one. Believe me, he is lying to you. Because one plus one plus one is three, it is not one. Hope that answers the question. Asalaamu Alaikum. My name is Muhammad Javed. And my question is, why can't God not take a human form? The brother asked the question, that why can God not take a human form? If God wants, He can take a human form. But the moment He takes a human form, He ceases to be God. Because God and man, they are two opposites. Man is mortal. God is immortal. You can't have a mortal and immortal person at the same time. Man has a beginning. God has got no beginning. You can't have a person who has a beginning and no beginning at the same time. Man has an end. God has no end. So you can't have a person having an end and no end at the same time. It doesn't make sense. So you can't have a God-man. You can either have God or you can have man. You can't have a God-man. So if God takes human form, he ceases to be God. He becomes human being. Because man requires to eat. God does not require to eat. The Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 14, that he feedeth everyone, but doesn't require to be fed. The human beings, they require rest, they require sleep. The Quran says in Ayat al-Qursi, chapter number 2, verse number 255, which was also recited by the Qari, Brother Shaf Muhammadi, Allahu la ilaha al-hayyul qayyum, la ta khudu sunatam wa la naam, lau ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Allah, He is one and only. The self-existing, the eternal. No slumber can seize him, nor does he require sleep. To him belongs everything in the heaven and the earth. Therefore, 
God when he takes the human form he ceases to be God you can't have a God man together and if a God becomes human being and gives up his quality and becomes man why should you worship a human being because he has same power than you and me people will want to worship you and me also then what is the use of worshipping a person who has same powers like you and me and later on if someone tells me the same human being became God it's not possible if human beings can become God even you and I would become God tomorrow therefore if Allah wants he can become a human being but he will cease to be a God therefore Allah will never want to become a human being Allah can tell a lie if he wants but he will never tell a lie because to lie is ungodly the moment he lies he ceases to be God Allah can do injustice if he wants but he will not because to do injustice is ungodly as the Holy Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 40 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree so if he does injustice he ceases to be God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he wants he can make a mistake but he will not make a mistake because to make mistake is ungodly the Quran says in Surah Taha chapter number 20 verse 52 that Allah does not make mistake Allah does an err so if he makes a mistake he ceases to be God Allah can forget if he wants but he will not forget because forgetting is an ungodly act the Quran says in Surah Taha chapter 20 verse 52 Allah doesn't make a mistake neither does he forget the moment he forgets he ceases to be God therefore the Holy Quran says in Allah ala kulli shayin kadir verily Allah has power over all things in several places in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 106 in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 109 Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 284 Surah Al-Imran chapter number 3 verse 29 Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse 77 in Surah Fatir chapter 35 verse number 1 Allah says in Allah ala kulli shayin kadir for verily Allah has power over all things but Allah only does godly things he doesn't do ungodly things because Quran says in Surah Buraj chapter 85 verse number 16 Allah is the doer of all he intends whatever Allah intends he can do but he only intends godly things this theory of God becoming a human form is called as anthropomorphism almighty God taking a human form and most of the major religions sometime or the other they have in their philosophy that God has taken human form some religion once some several times and they have a very beautiful logic for that they say that God Almighty He is so pure He is so holy He doesn't know regarding the feelings of the human being regarding the shortcomings the difficulties a human being can have He is so holy and pure and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know how does the human being feel when he's hurt how does he feel when he gets into trouble so therefore God Almighty came in the form of a human being in this world to set the rules for the human being on the face of it very good logic but I tell these people that if I manufacture a tape recorder do I have to become a tape recorder to know what is good or what is bad for the tape recorder no I just write an instruction manual that when you want to play the audio cassette put in the cassette press the play button when you want to stop press the stop button when you want to fast forward press the FF button don't drop it from a height it will get spoiled don't immerse it in water it will get damaged I write an instruction manual I don't have to become a tape recorder to know what is good or what is bad for the tape recorder similarly when almighty God is our creator he doesn't have to become a human being to know what is good or what is bad for the human being he sends an instruction manual and the last and final instruction manual for the human beings is the Holy Quran the Holy Quran is the last and final instruction manual for the human beings the do's and don'ts for the human beings and he need not come down in this world as a human being to give us the instruction manual what does he do? he chooses a man amongst men to deliver his message whom we call as messengers or prophets 
who he communicates on a higher level through the revelation. It is so clear cut to any logical person that God Almighty cannot take human form. But any fool can also understand. That is the reason the Holy Quran says in Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse number 18. Summum bukmun um yun formula erjiun. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will not come to the true path. And the Bible gives the same message. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 13, verse number 13, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Rig Veda also gives the same message. In book number 10, chapter number 71, verse number 4, that though they see the word, they see it not. Though they hear the word, they hear not. Next question from the ladies. Assalamu alaikum. If all the major religions and scriptures speak about one God, then does it imply that all these religious scriptures, that is Bible, Vedas, etc., are the word of God? And does it further imply that whichever religion you follow, be it Islam or Hinduism or Christianity, it is one, the same? A sister asked the question that I have quoted so many various scriptures and proved about the concept of Almighty God, that is monotheism. Does it imply that all these religious scriptures I quoted, they are the word of Almighty God? And does it imply that irrespective of whether you follow Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, it's one and the same? Sister, many people have the misconception that Islam came into existence and the founder of the religion of Islam was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 14 years ago. In fact, Islam is there in existence since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 24, im min ummatin illa khalafiha nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner. The Holy Quran says in Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 7, وَلِقُلِّ قَوْمٍ had And to every nation have we sent a guide. By name, only 25 are mentioned in the Holy Quran. But our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, there were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. By name, we know only 25 mentioned in the Holy Quran. Adam, Moses, Jesus, Solomon, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But there were more than 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. Similarly, by name, we know only four revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil and the Furqan. Torah is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Furqan, that's the Holy Quran, is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But if you analyze that all the other scriptures, whether are they the word of God or not, Bible, can I say it's the word of God or not? We believe in the Injil, the Wahi which was given to Isa alayhi salam. This Bible that the Christians have today is not the Wahi which we believe in. This Bible does contain the word of God. It also contains the word of prophet and also words of historian as well as pornography. It's totally not the word of God. No wonder the Christian scholars, they are keeping on revising the Bible. We believe in the original Wahi given to Isa salam, but the present Bible is not the correct wahi. It may contain part of the wahi. How to check up which part is true? You have to check it with the Furqan. And the Furqan is the Holy Quran. Similarly, if you analyze all the messengers that were sent before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, all the revelations that came before Holy Quran, all of these revelations and these messengers were only sent for their people. And the message was supposed to be followed only for a particular limited time period. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 49, that Isa alayhi salam, he was sent only for the Bani Israel. 
the message is repeated in Surah Saf chapter 61, verse number 6, that Isa alayhi salam, the son of Mary, was sent only for the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. The same message is given in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tells his disciples that go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims. Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That means he was only sent for the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, that I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So all the messengers and all the revelation, by name only four revelations are given in the Holy Quran. But there were several revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Sufa, Ibrahim and various other revelations. But all the revelations that came before the Holy Quran and all the messengers that came before Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they were only sent for their people and for a particular time period. But our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Holy Quran says, in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 107, it says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not, but as a mercy to the whole of humankind, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures. The Holy Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter 34, verse number 28, that وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا قَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning them against sin but most of the humankind yet do not know similarly all the religious scriptures that were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came before the Quran were only meant for that people and for a particular time period but the holy Quran it says in Surah Ibrahim chapter 14 verse 52 as well as Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 185 and Surah Al-Zumur chapter 39 verse number 41 that it was sent for the whole of humanity. Regarding a question that are these scriptures, the Vedas, the Bible, the Zed Avesta, the Satir, the Upanishad, are they the word of Almighty God? What I can say that we believe in Injil as the word of God but the present Bible is not the word of God. Regarding Veda, Upanishad, Gita, Zedavesta, Dasati, I can say maybe they were the word of God, maybe. I cannot say for sure. Since the Quran does not say that Veda is the word of God, I cannot say for sure. I can only say maybe they were word of God. But even if they were the word of God, all the scriptures besides the Holy Quran have been changed by human beings. They have been corrupted. As a famous critic of Islam, William Muir, he said two centuries before that the only religious scriptures which has maintained its purity is the Holy Quran for 12 centuries. William Muir, who is a very strong critic of Islam, he had to agree that this Quran has maintained its original purity for 12 centuries. He said this 200 years before. So, regarding the messengers, whether Ram, whether Lakshman, all these, were they messengers of God or not? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was, because the Quran says. But the name of Ram and Buddha and Zoroaster is not mentioned in the Quran. So what I can say, maybe they were, I don't know. But even if they were, they were only meant for that time. And they were only supposed to be followed by that particular people. The scriptures that came before the Quran, they were only meant for a particular group of people and they were only meant to be followed till that time. So even if they were words of God, even if the previous messengers were messengers of God, you only have to follow the last and final messenger that is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Even if the other scriptures were the word of God, today you have to follow the last and final message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the Holy Quran and nothing else. Regarding, can you be a Christian, Hindu, Muslim, it's the same? No sister, it's not the same. Why? Because if you analyze, the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3, verse number 52, that Jesus, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. Same thing as the Bible says in Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse number 30. I seek not my will, but the will of my father. If you translate into Arabic, 
not my will, God's will, it is nothing but Islam. He was a Muslim. Abraham, peace be upon him, the Holy Quran says, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 67, he was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. So today, if you have to choose any religion, the Holy Quran says, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, in the Dina, in the Allah al-Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. Though the other religions speak about monotheism, only monotheism is not sufficient. You have to believe in Tawheed. You have to do the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the Holy Quran repeats the message in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 85, that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, submitting the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will not be accepted of him. And in the year after, he'll be among the losers. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Azam Khan, and a mechanical engineer by profession. First, I congrats you for the beautiful speech you had delivered. Now, my question is, water is called by different names in different languages, like in English as water, in Hindi as Pani, in Tamil as Tani. Similarly, if God is either called Ram or Jasa, is it not one and the same? So let's pose the question that water in different languages can be called as water in English, Pani in Hindi, Tani in Tamil. Similarly, God is one. Can we not call him by Ram or Jesus, etc.? Peace be upon him. As I mentioned in my talk, the Holy Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 110, Holidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayat Ma Tadu, Fala Al Asma Al Husna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name and it should not conjure up a mental picture, it should contain the qualities of Almighty God. And the same message is repeated in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 8. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 180. As well as in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 24, which says, To Allah belongs the most beautiful name. You can call him by any name, but it should not conjure up a mental picture. Regarding a question that water is called by different names in different languages, and I know about it. In English it's called as water, in Hindi as Pani, in Tamil as Sunni, in Arabic it's called as Ma'in, in Surah Alambia chapter 21 verse number 30, in Sanskrit it's called as Apa, in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 7 verse number 4. In Shuddha Hindi it's called as Jal, in Gujarati as Jal or Pani, in Marathi as Pani, it's called as in Kannad, it's called as Nir, in Telugu Nir, and Malayalam as Dallam, various languages. You can call. I gave you only 10 examples. Quran gives 99 attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there is no objection if you call water in any language as long as it is water. In any language. But it should be water. It should not be something else. For example, if suppose someone comes and tells me that I have been advised by my friend that every day in the morning I should have one glass of Pani. I know Pani means water, so I understand what he's saying. But then he continues, but when I have that one glass of Pani, I feel like vomiting. I ask him, why do you feel like vomiting? So he tells me, because the water stinks. It is yellowish in color. Later I realize that what he's talking is not Pani, it is urine. <laughs> so somebody told him that you have one glass of urine. But the name he gave was Pani. So you can call water by Pani, Tani, Mani, Apa, Pani, no problem. But it should be water. You can call water by any name. But anything else beside water, neither can you call it water, neither can you call it Pani, neither can you call it Tani, neither can you call it as Mani. Water as water you can call. But something else as water you can't call. People may think that what? An illogical example. Even an ignorant person can make out the difference between urine and water. Only a fool will not know the difference between urine and water. And I agree with them. 
that even an ignorant person knows the difference between urine and water. Similarly, those people who know the concept of Almighty God, the correct concept, they say that these people who worship false God, they are not only ignorant, they are foolish. Can't they differentiate between a true God and a false God? You give it any name, but if it's a true God, you can give it the name of God. If it's not a true God, you're giving false God the name of God, aren't they foolish? They are foolish. For example, if you want to buy some gold, there's a person who comes and wants to sell his gold jewelry to you. And he says, this is 24 karat sona. You know that sona in Hindi means gold. In Arabic it is zahaba. You know it very well. But even after knowing that sona in Hindi is for gold, yet you will not just buy it like that. You will verify whether the sona, what is calling 24 karat sona, is it actually 24 karat gold or not. You will not just buy it off. What will you do? You will go to a goldsmith and verify whether it is actually 24 karat sona or not. And after verifying with the touchstone, you know I give the example of touchstone in my talk. He tells you, it is fake. Though the jewelry was glittering, but all that glitter is not gold. You will verify before buying the sona, whether it's actually sona or not. Why? Because they have to pay money for it. You know, you don't want to lose. Because you know, if you lose a thousand rupees or ten thousand rupees, it's precious. So why don't you do the same when anyone says this is God? You check it up with the touchstone. Which is the touchstone? Surah Ikhlas. Chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute eternal. Lam minit walam yulad. He begets not nor is begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufanad. There is nothing like him. So anyone says this is God, you first check it up with the touchstone whether actually is God or not. If he fits in that definition, we have got no objection accepting that person who they are calling as Almighty God. For example, suppose some lunatic, he says that Muhammad 